Blizzard have finally broken their silence on the collegiate Hearthstone protest. Then Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 has been delayed, and the boss of Devolver Digital wants the Steam vs. Epic debate to reset. All of that and more on today's episode of The Roundup. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Roundup. It's been a busy week as always, and before we get started, be sure to like, sub, and ring that bell to let the YouTube algorithm know that you're enjoying the content. And with that said, let's dive in. Blizzard have finally dished out punishment to the American University Collegiate Hearthstone team following their on-stream protest. Casey Chambers, a player for the American University team who went by the handle Excelsior, took to Twitter to share a letter from Blizzard. The letter talks about Blizzard's every voice matters value and emphasizes is that environments such as tournament broadcasts need to be a place where all are welcome. So to that end, the three members of the collegiate team have been handed a six-month competitive ban. And I think this is actually good news. This decision marks the end of a strikingly long period of silence from Blizzard, and it represents another step in Blizzard trying to stabilize their position. Now, the thing is that this comes in the wake of Blizzard's decision to shorten Blitzchung's ban, and that means that now all protesting players are being punished equally. That is actually what the American University team wanted in the first place, so I think it's fair. Now, while Blizzard were swift and decisive in punishing Blitzchung for his on-screen protest, they definitely did take their time with this American University situation. This apparent reluctance on Blizzard's part to punish the team led to sharp criticism from myself, also from the American University team themselves. It suggested that Blizzard didn't care about the political speech once it was out outside of China's site. Now, as an aside, we reported on this channel a few videos back that Hearthstone competitor Gods Unchained actually reached out to Blitzchung following his ban, and they offered to cover his prize money, which at the time we thought he wouldn't get, and um, then also to give Blitzchung a spot in their upcoming tournament. Well, it actually turns out that uh, Casey Chambers has been playing Gods Unchained in his spare time, following the team's announcement that they're stepping away from uh, Hearthstone altogether, and uh, yeah, Chambers confirmed that the team behind Gods Unchained actually reached out to him with a message of support. So uh, yeah, I think throughout all of this, clearly the Gods Unchained acquisition team, they've been working pretty darn hard. And I'm pretty sure that initially following Blitzchung, they actually had some server stability issues because so many people tried their game after it just got so much exposure from the Blitzchung ban. Absolutely though, a case of Blizzard being between a rock and a hard place. I think the six month ban for Blitzchung itself is uh, a little bit overboard when you consider what he did. It was just a quick thing in a stream. So, uh, I mean, the duration of the shortening of that ban, in my view, still is motivated by the by the wish to, uh, you know, to appease China, and I think that has passed on to this particular team. There are other things which would be considered political stances in other countries that aren't the West that I don't think Blizzard would have punished as, uh, as stridently, but of course, I've covered that before in another video. Okay, by this stage, we are all very, very well versed in the exclusivity goings-on of the Epic Games Store and its uh, state goal of challenging Steam's dominance in the market. This conversation has went in many different directions, with Steam coming under fire for its uh, revenue splits, which mostly are industry standard, but it's also fair to say that 30% is quite a bit for digital only as compared to some aspects of retail, and uh, Epic's marketplace also being severely lacking in functionality. It's uh, time though, according to the Devolver Digital founder Graham Struthers, to reset the conversation. So, speaking to GameSpot.com at PAX Australia, Struthers said that the conversation never really took place properly. He said that Steam's launch forever changed the landscape of PC gaming, and that it was an integral part of the success that many, like Devolver, have had since. And that really is true, even take us doing indie development without digital distribution being the norm, like what we're doing wouldn't really be possible, so we do owe a lot Steam there historically. Struthers pointed to the reliability as well of Steam, saying that with Steam, payment is every month, it's accurate, it's straightforward, and it's transparent, and that this in turn has meant that publishers like Devolver were able to change their relationship with developers for the better. Basically, the clarity allowed for a more equitable situation. Struthers also spoke of Steam 7030 revenue split model rather positively. He emphasized that back at the time, Steam's 30% was much more generous than anything else. Struthers said that before Steam publishers were lucky to come away with 25%, though he wasn't really clear where that number came from. Now, we've
we've heard that even physical retail stores take 30%, so what's actually going on there? Now, what I'm assuming Struthers was talking about there is really just the entire sales chain and what the publisher would get out of it. So that's covering, say, you know, your retail sales post-platform cut, post-distributor cut, post-retailer cut, and all of those other things that you simply don't deal with if you're going through Steam. Now, in terms of the Steam versus Epic debate, Struthers basically had praise for everyone. He said that competition is good in the market, it's good for the industry overall, and that it offers different options for developers and publishers. That definitely is true. Now, that said, he also claims that directly comparing Steam to Epic isn't fair or helpful. He says that Steam's decade of experience has allowed for them to refine their platform, while Epic are following their own strategy and trying to shake up the market. And he concludes by saying that there's a ways to go, but competition is good. And I suppose I broadly agree with how he ended there. Competition is good, and over time, Steam will have to get better in order to compete with Epic. And, uh, well, if Epic doesn't get better to compete with Steam, it's probably in for a rough time. And the thing is, it's not like Steam can only compete on revenue split. So take an example, one of the recent features that uh, we talked about in a Roundup episode, where they essentially are going to be facilitating local multiplayer online. Well, if that's just a, you know, self-service free thing for developers to use that's on the Steam platform, that is another way in which they can provide meaningful value that in a few ways could be, yeah, in lieu of a revenue split. Next, though, we've got an interesting story that also touches on player psychology regarding Xbox Game Pass. So according to ID at Xbox lead Agostino Simonita, Xbox Game Pass subscribers are buying more titles and are trying a more extensive range of genres than they previously did. So apparently Game Pass subscribers are actually playing 40% more games overall, and that's even including titles that are outside of the Game Pass catalog. Simonita also said that people who join the subscription are way more engaged, and this engagement carries on outside the subscription, with many members heading to the store to buy more games than before. Simonita also states that this increase in games being played shows the willingness on the part of uh, Games Pass subscribers to actually get out there and to try games in new genres. And by the numbers here, 91% of people confirm that they wouldn't have played a specific game had it not been on Game Pass. Then Microsoft also revealed that members are playing 30% more genres after their Game Pass subscription. And I think that really is good news for just expanding the scope of experience that the average gaming customer actually has. Now, I think this engagement, it's undoubtedly notable, and perhaps it speaks to the strength of services like Game Pass. With such a vast library of games available for a low monthly cost, people seemingly are willing to just take the plunge into an unknown title or an unexplored genre. It seems to increase people's risk tolerance because it's no longer directly attached to cash. Not only that, but Simonita's figures also reveal that subscribers are more likely to buy games from the store outright. So at any rate, this sounds like a big win for Microsoft, and they really seem to be just creating a like a dedicated user base who really cares about the experience they get from the Games Pass uh, platform. And I've got to imagine that going into the next generation, that's going to be a major point of competition in Microsoft's favor. Next up, though, we've got some completely good news for a change. Saints Row 2 is going to ride again on the PC platform. So thanks to an unupdated Steam port, which is just riddled with bugs and glitches, the PC version of this, I'd say pretty classic game, has been practically unplayable for years. I mean, you need mods and guides to even boot the darn thing. Now, the reason why it's been dormant for so long is actually that the original source code was lost. So, answering a fan question, Volition said that the PC port was done externally, and that this resulted in the source code actually being lost during THQ's bankruptcy auction. Well, this week the code turned up, and Volition revealed via a live stream that Saints Row 2 will be rebuilt for Steam. And this project is going to make its way through Steamworks and will implement much needed performance fixes. The developer have also confirmed that previously console exclusive DLC will be making it to the PC for the first time. So, it's a fixed up game and unreleased content will make it to the platform. Overall, a very welcome move from Volition. It's a fan favorite game. A lot of people remember that one fondly for the balance that it struck between being wacky and being serious, and it certainly will pave the way well for Saints Row 5. That said, I will be honest with you, open world fatigue has pretty much murdered my willingness to, uh, to actually get involved there, but still, it is good news. Next, though, it was announced this week that Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 will not hit its Q1 2020 release date. Devs Hardsuit Labs made the announcement 
announcement via an open letter saying that they have decided to value quality over making that Q1 launch window. They noted that the first game suffered from its early release, and it really did, and that they just feel responsible, like a responsibility, to not uh, have that problem happen again. And I think this is reassuring. I think it's really good. The more that we see developers take their time to deliver a more complete product, the better. You only need to look into the recent past, right? Several high-profile games in recent years could have done with a lot more time in the oven, so seeing this and even seeing, say, Doom be delayed, yeah, it's pretty heartening. Next up, though, we've got a little bit more drama. This week, it's coming from the mobile version of Space Strategy Sim Stellaris that was announced by publisher Paradox Interactive. So, this game, which is called Stellaris Galaxy Command, it was briefly available for testing across select regions before being taken offline by the publisher. Why? Well, one Stellaris fan noted that there was a pretty darn serious problem with the Galaxy of Command assets, as, uh, well, some of them were directly taken from the Halo series. One hangar environment, which formed the backdrop for a mission in Halo 4 was um, actually just pulled out pretty much from Halo 4 entirely. It was just missing some dropships. Pretty wild for that to happen, and to their credit, Paradox Interactive was swift to act when it came to uh, them being made aware of these stolen assets, and they basically just took the game servers offline. So they took the immediate financial hit. They then said that they were beginning a full audit of uh, the studio behind the game, which is a Chinese developer called Game Bear, uh, to see if any other assets have, uh, well, had the same thing happen. So what actually happened here is is this the studio, like, literally stealing assets for their game, or is it something else? Well, I'll say this. It's common practice across the industry to grab assets like that, to try to use them in context. So, like, I mean, even an example from our past, we took some assets from, uh, from like, a Rayman game. We brought them in to do some testing to try to learn what were the really good things that those assets did. We then immediately deleted them and followed up with our own artwork. Uh, take Warcraft 3 Reforged. Again, some placeholder stuff was data mined there, where seemingly some fan art was used. Now, it was a bit wild that made it to data mining, but across AAA, AA, Indie, this is common practice within the industry. That said, for it to actually make it that far, that is absolutely wild. Uh, this is something that should really never make it past doing a quick test, a, you know, maybe a deeper dive into an asset in Photoshop to work out, you know, just what are the techniques that were so good in this other instance? This actually making it that far, though, a little bit wild. What I'll say is that it could just be that, uh, yeah, the studio were trying to cut costs. It could also be that the asset was in the game. One artist did it. Nobody else really noticed the problem, and everyone just saw it as a part of the game, and it just got overlooked. What I do know, though, is that this game coming out in a few regions initially, that's often called the soft launch period for a mobile game, and that's a very important period because that's when the business model of it is being tested. So for Paradox to actually pull it in response, that's that is showing that they're willing to take a financial hit to ensure that they're not, uh, you know, doing the job wrong there. But of course, if they did launch that with Halo 4 assets, I mean, there'd be serious legal issues there. So overall, an interesting story, and I hope uh, I hope I was able to turn that into a little bit of, uh, just give you a little bit of knowledge about how uh, that stuff's actually done quite a lot in AAA. You just never actually see it in the end product. So anyway, there you go. That's it for this week's uh, final episode of the Roundup. Be sure to let me know what you thought about the stories down below. And with that, I will see you next time.